Our story begins just shortly after the events of Ned Stark's capture. He had been declared a traitor and held prisoner. Arya had disappeared, and Sansa was now a political prisoner of the Lannisters. Rob the young wolf, seen through the ruse, called upon his bannermen. Rob would then send a letter to John, informing him of the events that transpired. Around the same time, two others would rise up in rebellion to the Lannisters. Renly would crown himself king, as well as Stannis, who had sent out ravens of Joffrey's real parents. John, who at this point was recovering from a burn and a fight with a right, was soon to take his vows. Yet he would first receive a raven from Rob. Gior would question John's commitment, but would not stop the boy, as he had not yet taken his vows. John wanted a place to belong, and so far, the watch was not such a place. And while he wanted to find his uncle, his father was imprisoned, sisters either hostages or dead, and his brothers in open rebellion. To John, duty was everything to him, and in his heart, that meant being there for his family. Who knew what would come from them if he wasn't there? He wouldn't be able to forgive himself if he didn't act now. John would attempt to give Longclaw back to Jior, who instead would refuse, saying that the sword is his. He saved his life and means to do justice by it, so he should keep it. As John prepares to leave the next day, he is met in the courtyard by Jior with a small host. This includes Sam, Grin, Pip, and Ed. Jior would inform him that Sam had not yet taken his vows and would be best suited away from the wall. Perhaps a maester at Winterfell. Jior would then inform John that the others would be tasked with bringing Joffrey to the wall upon his arrest. Jior would then give lasting advice to John about being a leader and the difference between a man and a boy. Finally, they would be sent off as Jior would then muster his men to begin preparing to go north to the wall. Some time would pass by the time John and his company would arrive at Winterfell. There, John would see Bran, now awake, as well as Rickon, Mr. Lewin, and Sir Roger Castle. The happy reunion would be cut short, however, as ravens would come with the news that Ned Stark had been beheaded. Rob in defiance and vengeance had declared open war and was crowned king of the north, with the Riverlands backing his claim for independence. With no news of Arya and the possibility of her being dead, John questioned what should be done next. It was then decided that John would meet with Rob. He would reach his brother and from there march on King's Landing. John would talk with the group of all whom he considered brothers and they decided to split. Sam and Pip would stay at Winterfell. Sam would be taken under Lewin's tutelage as well. Since he had not taken his vows, he had legal claim to House Tarly. As for Pip, another good archer and representative of the Night's Watch would allow for more political and personal protection for Bran and Rickon. The new trio would make their way southward once more, heading towards the Riverlands. It would be nearly another week, but after five days of riding, on the sixth morning, John would arrive at Riverrun. Inside the castle, Rob would be met with a number of harsh decisions. Caitlin had released Jamie, and citing a small mutiny as Lord Karstark had killed three Lannister boy prisoners in response. Edmure, unaware of Rob's battle plans, repelled Tywin's army at a river, thus destroying Rob's plan to lure him out away from King's Landing. What was worse is that Rob had just received a letter from Balon Greyjoy declaring Ironborn independence. Rob was struggling on who to now trust amongst his lords and council, as they all seemed to be acting independently and on their own accord. Rob needed to wrangle in his army. A chance with the luck would arrive. Entering the Great Hall, John and his friends would enter. It would be a great delight for Rob seeing his brother arrive. Edmure and Brandon were happy to see Rob in a different mood, as well as Jane, who for the first time was seeing someone else in Rob's family other than his uncles and mother. Rob questioned the happy surprise, as he believed John would be a member of the Night's Watch by now. John would explain that while it might have been something he wanted, he wanted more so to be here for his family. John would notice Catelyn in the room and would calmly bow to her, saying, My lady Stark. Catelyn didn't quite know how to address John, but with so many things going wrong, she gave him a smile, replying, It's good to see you, John. It was the first ever act of kindness John had received from her, and he was unsure of how to act. Rob would then inform John of his struggles and ask for his advice. John wouldn't fully know how to help, but he spoke to Rob that if he intended to pass judgment on Lord Karstark, that he must be prepared to lose their support. John would also discuss the matter of Catelyn moving freely after releasing Jamie. John would then explain to Rob that his anger with Edmure is misplaced as well. As for Theon, they couldn't be sure of his betrayal, as Balon could never fully be trusted. Rob would then ask what he thinks he should do. John would then tell him he isn't the king, but Rob did need to send the message that he was. The following day, Rob would summon his lords in council. The Blackfish, Edmure, Catelyn, Lord Umber, Roose Bolton, Lord Karstark, Jane Westerling, and now John. 
Rob would now pass his commands. The first thing he did was remind them all that he was in fact their king, declaring that all men who helped Lord Karstark break in would be sentenced to death. When Lord Karstark protested, Rob reminded him that Lord Karstark still had one more son within their ranks, and Rob was entirely sure if he had a hand in the attack and therefore would allow lenience to him. As for Lord Karstark, his actions would be considered an act of passion and grief, and therefore, as punishment for his actions, he would be tasked with taking his troops back north to deal with the Ironborn threat. As for his son, he would remain with Rob as one of his king's Stark. Lastly, for Lord Karstark, he and his men would be tasked with escorting Catelyn Stark to Winterfell, where she would reside for the rest of the war. This acted as a punishment for both of them. Rob could no longer trust Catelyn to think clearly, and he her away from his main force for morale. As for Lord Karstark, in almost every way, he was put into an unwinnable condition. He had to protect the woman who threw away his chance for revenge. His son was now a political prisoner, and he was being driven away to fight an entirely different war. To end the Karstark matter, Rob would then make a final decision. He would announce the raising of a new house. Jon Snow would be declared legitimate, and his new house, House Snow, would be created. All were surprised by this act. Even more was the shocking news that followed after. John was named Rob's heir until he sired the son. He would then be betrothed to Alice Karstark. This would unite House Karstark to House Snow, as well as fully secure the loyalty of the Karstarks from performing any more mutinous actions. Rob wouldn't start there. Next, Rob would then, after getting advice from Roos, would declare that his bastard Ramsay will be tasked with finding Theon Greyjoy and discovering whether he is in fact a traitor. If so, then he will face the traitor's justice. Rob would then declare that the Blackfish will stay in Riverrun and hold it from any attempts from the Lannisters. As for Edmure, since Rob had married Jane, would be married to one of Walder Frey's daughters and would take control of the twins as its heir. Rob would then ask for a volunteer force to track down Jaime Lannister and bring him back to the north where he would be beheaded, telling Lord Karstark that if he succeeded in his campaign with the Greyjoys, then he'd have the pleasure of dealing the striking blow. John would volunteer much to the people's surprise, telling Rob that the best way to repay him for all that he's doing for him, as well as give his future father-in-law closure, is to bring them Jamie Lannister. John would head out immediately with his fellow brothers. Roos would then offer John the assistance of one of his best trackers to join him. Rob would accept this offer, saying that upon his return, John would have his wedding. Rob would end the meeting, declaring that if any of them took issue with his commands, they were welcome to a trial with his dire wolf. The following morning, John and his group would prepare to ride south. Mounting their horses, they would be greeted by Roose Bolton's huntsman, Locke. The four would give their greetings, and playful words would be shared amongst them. With a growing morale not being planted, the four would ride, knowing that Jamie and Brienne, being on foot, would allow them to catch up. They would make their way down south, adjacent to the King's Road. The lands were still considered tested, but luckily for them, Tywin's forces stayed farther south, trying to claim more parts of the Stormlands. The group's first main clue of Jamie and Brienne's whereabouts came when they found a group of Stark soldiers having been slain near a small bridge. Almost two more whole days would pass as they grew closer to their targets. That night, Locke would make conversation with the others, talking about his various hunts as well as some of the battles he was a part of. Grin and Ed would talk about their upbringing, as well as John discussing his time at Winterfell. He would then tell Locke of the white he killed, and how he got his sword. Locke would then say that John seems to be a much level-headed man than Roose Bolton's bastard. As morning came, Brienne and Jamie argue amongst themselves mainly about honor and family, and even duty. Yet their banter is cut short as they hear trotting hoofs coming over the mountain near them. The two begin to run, but their fleeing is folly. John and his group rounded the duo. Jamie is the first to recognize John, calling him Ned Stark's bastard. Brienne spoke up, saying she was acting on Caitlin Stark's command. John would shut her down, saying that Lady Catelyn was not the king, and that her actions had made her a traitor to the north. Brienne, knowing what would become of her if she was captured, drew her sword, cutting side of Locke's horse. His mount would cry out, knocking him off his horse, breaking his bow as he fell. Ed would ride towards her, only to be knocked off as well by Jamie, who pulled him down. Grin would leap from his horse, knocking Jamie off of Ed. The two get into a quick punching match. Jamie was a good fighter, but Grin was much more of a brute, taking the first two hits and putting Jamie into a bear hug. Brienne, meanwhile, had engaged in a sword duel with John. The two of them flourishing their steel as they moved past each other. Brienne had not expected for John to be as good as he was, and she was tired from her journey being on foot. As Locke finally got up, John ordered him to get Jamie, who at this point was now able to knock himself free of Grin by headbutting his face and taking his sword from his sheath. 
Jamie and Ed began a quick duel, which even though his wrists were still bound together and he was tired, Jamie was still outmatching him. That was until Grim picked up a large rock and chucked it, hitting Jamie in the back, causing him to fall. Locke took this moment to knock Jamie down, kicking his sword away. The trio held their blades at Jamie's face and neck. Brienne and John's duel came to a close. As Locke called out, Brienne saw and stopped fighting. Brienne would drop her sword and surrender, seeing it was now futile to continue. John would take her sword and order Ed to bind her. Locke then, without warning, would pull out his hunting knife and cut Jamie's right hand off then and then. Everyone was shocked by this sudden act, but Locke would quickly argue that he almost killed Ed and Grin with his hand still tied. With this, they no longer have to worry about him attempting anything else. John didn't like it, but looking at his friends and seeing them bloodied agreed to an extent. John would have Jamie and Brienne ride together, tied and bound. Their horse would be guided by Grin and Ed who would ride together. Lastly, Locke and John would ride on the flanks to ensure they couldn't flee. That night, they would camp. Grin and Ed would thank Locke for helping them out, to which Locke would congratulate the two for surviving a duel with Jamie Lannister, a rare feat. John would tell Brienne that while he knows she was just following the orders and doing her duty, she still betrayed his brother. He would ask if she was the one who killed the soldiers they found. She would tell him of the men that they were hanging on the trees. John told her that he would ask Rob for mercy for her, and that there is a good chance he'll grant it. Though as for Jamie, he'll either hang or lose his head. John would then talk to the others, suggesting that what Locke did was a little excessive. Locke would shrug it off, saying that it was the safest bet for them, suggesting that while John might stand a chance after seeing him fight Brienne, it's safe for the rest of them this way. John would ponder on it and still find himself agreeing with it. Finally, though, John would take a sword and stick into the fire but until it became red hot. Rising up, he marched over to Jamie. Everyone looked on, wondering what he would do. John would then tell Jamie that he knows it was him who pushed Bran from the window. Jamie would just murmur back to him that, it's, that if he was going to kill him, to just get on with it. John simply grabbed Jamie's stump, and to his cries of pain, John would take his sword and cauterize his wound. Jamie would quickly pass out from the shock. John would then hand Brienne some bread, telling her that when he wakes to feed him, John would then say to the others that he still live until he gets to rob. Then he will face his justice. Unbeknownst to John, or anyone else for that matter, not too far away, a duel makes their way towards the twins. Arya Stark and her protector, Sandor Clegane, have journeyed many miles in order for Arya to be united with her older brother. Since the death of her father and capture of her sister, Arya had been on the run. First with the Night's Watch, when she was protected by a fellow brother, Yorin, until he was slain by the Lannisters. From there she found refuge with the Brotherhood Without Banners and the care of Sir Beric Dondorian and Thor Samir. But the time there soon ended as well. Eventually they were met by the Red Woman, where upon taking her friend, Gendry fled the group, only to eventually cross paths with the Hound. Their time started off very tense and heated as Sandor acted more as her captor, but as time went on, the two found common ground, even helping each other against Lannister soldiers. Now, after so long, the pair was drawing near to their destination, having crossed into the Riverlands. John walked the camp, kicking dirt upon the fire as the others got onto their horses. John paced over to Jamie to check his hand. The cauterizing had stopped the bleeding and its near entirety, and so far there seemed to be no infection. Jamie just stared at him dazed, with flickers of anger in his eyes. John apologized for the hand, but remarked that his brother could no longer walk, and as far as John was concerned, they were even. Locke commented that they would reach River Run by nightfall, as it began to ride once more, not far watching them, right over the hill, Arya and the Hound waited for them to pass. Arya questioned who they were. The Hound would say he doesn't know for sure. They were in contested lands, and Lannister scouts could be anywhere. For now, they should play it safe until they reached the Twins. As night came, the castle was full of music and celebration. The party was extravagant, as all of the main northern lords were in attendance at Edmure and Rosalind's wedding. The fiddlers played joyful tunes, and the many lords and soldiers enjoyed the company of the servants and wenches. Arya and the Hound found themselves outside of the castle trying to find a way inside. A guard stops them and questions who they are. When the Hound points out that he has Arya Stark, he is met with skepticism. The guardsman orders him to wait, as he'll send word and get his commander the Blackfish to come meet them. With no other choice, the two find a place to wait just outside the castle gate. Unbeknownst to them, John and his group arrive just outside the first set of encampments. They inform the guard that they come with Jaime Lannister. The guardsman ushers them through the guard post, and the four begin to ride down the main road to the castle. Yet as they draw near the castle gate, John noticed Jamie take a glance at the man standing next to him. It was the hound who looked as though he had saw a ghost standing in front of him. 
John also noticed who stood next to the hound. It was Arya. The sudden joy and excitement they both felt, though, would immediately be cut short, as from the gate itself, three frayed men would suddenly appear and cut the throats of two Stark soldiers. Chaos would erupt all around the encampment and castle. The Boltons and Freys would begin stabbing and attacking Northmen everywhere they saw. Two men would come for the Hound, who drew his sword and killed the attackers. Arya herself would duck down, avoiding her attacker. John would ride over, hitting both men with his horse, before using Law Claw to slice down another. It would be just a brief moment, but John would glance around and bear witness to the other massacre that was now unfolding all around him. He would only snap back to the sound of his name. It was Gren. He and Ed were dismounted, killing Frey men that attacked them. Looking back at Locke, he would notice him with Jamie, holding him by his bounds. Locke would apologize, claiming that it was fun to be a part of the John's company, before disappearing off into the chaos. John would then make his way to Brienne, cutting her binds and handing her a sword, telling her to go after him. John would then look to the Hound, telling him to get Arya out of there and to go to Winterfell. The trio would then fight onwards into the castle. John would save his brother. As for Brienne, she would go after Locke and Jaime. Entering in, they would be able to sneak past a pair of frayed men who carried out a corpse. John would recognize the sigil on the female corpse. It was of House Mormont. A sinking feeling came into John's heart as they traversed the House of Horrors. They would come across a group of frayed men in the Great Hall and quickly ensue in a fight. Gren, using his size, would quickly get his opponent in a sword bind and toss him to the ground before killing him. Ed would parry a few swings before slashing the face of the Frey soldier. The last, John would recognize, is one of Walder Frey's sons, and upon seeing the corpse of Jane on the ground, John did not hold back, quickly sidestepped the swing and sliced the blade out of his hand. Now literally disarmed, the Frey's son would look up in terror as John brought his blade down upon his head. With no one else around, the trio would then turn to leave to continue through the castle. Yet as they reached a window, they would hear a chanting from outside. The three of them would look out a windowsill and see a blasphemous macabre image. The Frey and Bolton men would chant out, Here comes the King of the North, over and over, as they carried Rob's headless corpse on a horse, with Grey Wind's head mounted on top. John would fall back against the wall, heartbroken in disbelief. Grin would suggest to John that they needed to go. More would be coming any second, and they needed to escape. Ed seconded the idea, claiming that John needs to move. He still got his sister out there, and right now trying to get out of that mess, and they needed to go now if he's going to save her. John would shake his head in agreement, and they would begin making their way down the halls, only stopping when they came past another pair of freight men. They seemed to be guarding a door. A voice came out from the other side, begging to be released. The trio would make quick work of the two guards. Inside, they found Edmure and Rosalind. Edmure would demand what's happening. John would only toss him a sword, claiming that the Boltons and Freys had betrayed them. When Edmure questioned Rob where he was, he was only met with an empty and saddened look by John as he shook his head. Ed would ask about Rosalind. John would tell Gren to take her as she was coming with them as insurance. Hearing about what was happening, Edmure himself would not disagree with the action. While he was newly wed, he was in fact only just recently wed and did not know much of Rosalind. The group would eventually sneak their way out as many of the Fran Bolton armies had begun to clear their work and march around the area in celebration. Finding some horses, they would then begin riding out to safety, but to also find Arya. Arya and the Hound found themselves rushing through the tree line of the woods. The barking of dogs could be heard in the distance, along with the shouts of men who held their leashes. The Hound would toss Arya aside as a dog would leap out from the bushes nearby, nearly landing upon her. The hound with his sword drawn and one swift swing cut down the animal before it could once more try to attack Arya. A soldier wearing Bolton clothing came charging sword in hand from behind, yet he was stopped short from attacking the hound as Arya was able to thrust needle into his belly before even realizing she was there. The hound nodded, thanking her, and the two stood next to one another as they heard the noises of the trackers all around them. They were fully surrounded. Stepping from around the trees and into view, nearly a dozen men and two dogs showed themselves devilish grins and ill intent upon their faces. Stay close, the hound would tell her, as the two dogs were set loose. Only it would be then, with the sound of horses galloping, John would appear, trampling the first dog as he swung his sword to kill the other. Startled, the Bolton men were unable to prepare themselves as four more horses appeared. Grin flung his axe across the air, quickly dropping one of their foes. Ed circled the area with John as they cut down three men each. The hound killed two more as they tried to sneak in for a kill. 
Edmir with Rosalind, riding with him, brought the empty horse over to the Hound and Arya for them to mount, telling them to quickly get on. Arya and the others would watch as Jon continued to run down the Bolton men. There was some kind of darkness hanging over Jon now, and Arya had never seen it, yet she always thought it could always be there. Now after everything she's seen and experienced, after her father and now Rob, she understood it, for she felt it too. Jon would circle back to them, checking to see if they were okay before telling them that they needed to head back north to Winterfell. When the Hound questions if that was even possible with the Ironborn raid in the north, and now the Boltons and Freys having taken over, John will inform them that whether or not they control the North is not for certain. They still live, and so does their mother and their brothers. Rickon and Bran are still in Winterfell, with their mother already heading there now with the Karstark army. None will know of what transpired the night before yet. They needed to go now before it was too late. However, unknown to John, it was already much too late. Catelyn and Lord Karstark and their army came over the hill line to Winterfell to see smoke rising. As Catelyn's heart sank and the Karstark army rushed over, they found the main gates to the castle open and no one to be found. Catelyn would call for her children and none would answer. She would then see hanging from the walls the corpses of Maester Lewin and Old Nan. Lord Karstark would question the madness. His men would then call out, claiming that they were being attacked from the rear. Lord Karstark would call for his men to prepare for battle. They walked into a trap. Lord Karstark would curse the Ironborn. Yet a fear would creep into Catelyn as she smelt a foul burning stench. Walking around the corner to the stables, Catelyn would drop to her knees and scream as she witnessed a great terror. Two children laid on a pair of crosses having been flayed. Next to them, what seemed to be two massive dogs were burning in a fire. Above the children, a sign that reads, Here lies the Lords of Winterfell. She then turned her face to see the heads placed on pikes of both Sir Roderick and Hodor. With no more sound coming from her body, Catelyn looked up to see a man standing before her. He wore the sigil of House Bolton upon his chest and had a smirk upon his face that showed the true demented demon that lived behind his eyes. Lord Karstark would notice an assortment of other banners with the Ironborn flags. They were both of Frey and Bolton banners. Their armory, numbering around 2,000, mainly of Ironborn and other mercenaries, clashed upon the rear of Lord Karstark's 1,500 men. Lord Karstark would run to check on Catelyn, but it would be too late as he saw her lying on the ground with her throat slit. Lord Karstark would sound a retreat. His men were mounting heavy losses, and pretty soon he wouldn't have an army. Yet before he and his personal guard could flee the castle, they were set upon by a dozen of Bolton men who butchered them whole. Lord Karstark cried out as he killed man after man, only to be pierced by two arrows before falling. The remainder of his men fled the area in a full rout. Ramsay stood over Lord Karstark's body, pleased by his work. He was then met by one of Walder Frey's sons and Dagmar Clefjaw. The three of them would move on and prepare for the next steps of Rue Bolton's grand plans to take over the north. Deep in the north, though, past the Long Lake, a company of eight and two direwolves make camp for the night. Preparing the fire is Osha. Rick on six next to Shaggy Dog in summer. Jojen Reed helps Sam with Bran who he had been carrying on his back the entire journey. The two talk and discuss their abilities, as well as much of the things they know in the world. Pip stands on watch with a bow. Mira, with her own spear, walks away from the fire near the water, where she sees Theon contemplating a great deal of many things. She offers her condolences about Rob and the others, comforting him by telling him there is nothing he can do now or change, but what he was able to do for Bran and Rickon means everything to the world more than he knew more than anyone could know. Theon would thank her, and the two would rejoin the camp. John and his group would find themselves reaching the border of the Neck. Little words would be spoken amongst them as they tried to come to terms with their lives, and the idea that they are now going to be hunted in their own homeland. To avoid the growing Bolt and Frey patrols, they move east along the coast, before heading north once more. Reaching the shore, Arya pointed out a town off the distance nearly a day's ride away, John mentions that they are about a few days from White Harbor now, and would see a few villages. It would still be safer to avoid any, though, until they reach Winterfell. They would rest that night where they were. The next morning, they would all be awoken to blades pointed at their throats. John would awaken to see everyone held captive, yet from what he could tell, they weren't bold and afraid men. They weren't even ironborn. It took a moment before John heard the hound curse aloud as their captors lowered their weapons as one of them recognized Arya. She would call out his name as Ongai, Coming into view, two men showed themselves. 
one with an eye patch and the other with red hair placed into a bun. It was Sir Beric Dondarrion and his brotherhood. When the Hound questioned how they found them, Beric would turn his head and inform them it was by the Red Lady's power and the will of the Lord of the Light. Everyone would see Melisandre ride up on horseback. John asked what they wanted, and Melisandre would inform them that their quest to return home is folly. She had foreseen the deaths of their house and destruction of their home. They are now needed elsewhere. John would argue, not wanting to believe her, yet she would just tell him that his destiny, and if the Lord of Light wills it, his true family will be north at the Wall. John would question why the Wall, as nothing she was telling him was making sense. Melisandre would just tell him that the one true king Stannis Baratheon has sent her and the Brotherhood to find and take them to the Wall, for that is where the first battle in the wars to come for the living is to take place, and King Stannis wishes once more for House Stark and Baratheon to unite under one banner. Seeing no other real choice in the matter, John will accept the offer and the group will be placed upon a ship and sent north to meet with the one true king, Stannis Baratheon. Hey guys, so that's going to wrap up this, I would say, first part or first episode of my new Jon Snow uh, fan fiction, following of him never joining the Night's Watch and what that kind of entails. So, for the most part of this story, as you probably guessed by the fact that it's titled uh, Part 1 or Episode 1 by the time this goes up, I've had to split the video into multiple parts it was just getting too long and finding time to record it edit and everything has really been hard as of late so I decided to just go ahead and split it up into multiple episodes and as you can tell with this first episode it's already longer than what was the episodes of like the Rob Stark fanfic as of right now with this story I wanted to put focus on the fact that if John didn't join the Night's Watch and said opted to help Rob, I feel like he would have been a great, like, counsel to Rob about what to do in the midst of everything going to basically shit for Rob's campaign. I also really love the idea of if Rob had the proper counsel, he would, you know, pretty much put Lord Karstark in a position of, you cannot betray me now. Like right now, like I need your army, but at the same time, I can't have you in it. And so, basically, making sure that the Car Starks are 100% loyal to Rob Stark was probably the main bit I wanted to get put in, basically, in this story. As well as the second being, I believe John, having joined the Night's Watch, wishing to be a ranger and everything, I really feel like. If given the chance, he would want to go after uh, Jamie Lannister for Rob. Like, correct that mistake and basically prove his worth to Rob and get the man who uh, crippled his brother. And of course, you know, with his small companions of Grin and Ed, you know, the Night's Watch boys, I felt like it was best to just have them go with him and then also continue the idea of the plot of Roos sending his huntsman Locke from the show after him as well as the story progress i will be taking inspiration from both books and show but i'm excited to do something different for the rest of the story as we have yet to even discuss the events of like the wall the wilding plot there's all of stannis's plot and everything and the fact that john's group now already has like the hound and aria as a part of it I'm really interested to show you guys where I mean to take the story. So, yeah, I hope you guys uh, have enjoyed this first part, and I look forward to bringing the other ones out as soon as possible. Yeah, if you guys like the video, go ahead and like, subscribe, share, hit the bell, you know, all the stuff. And I will catch you guys later. See ya. This is JD. Bye.